I would like to start this presentation with a quote from one of my favorite researchers. This quote is from Marvin Stewart Antleman. He said, I am not interested in conspiracy theories. I'm interested in conspiracy facts. One should really read his books in order to get to the heart of what this conspiracy going on really is. Of course, there will always be debate about which facts come from so-called credible sources and which facts don't. Basically, the people who tell things which the mainstream doesn't approve of will always be considered as non-credible sources. But researchers like Anthony Sutton and Marvin Antelman always backed up all of their theories with well-documented facts, despite the mainstream authorities labeling them as conspiracy theorists. We will be quoting a lot from Anthony Sutton in order to answer the question of why didn't the Russians blow the whistle. So what is the opposite of a conspiracy theorist? That would be a conspiracy denier. This is an excellent article about the psychology of those people who deny that there is any conspiracy going on. Now, let us jump into the question of why didn't the Russians blow the whistle on NASA? I highly recommend people to watch this movie American Moon by Massimo Mazzucco. In this movie he does an excellent job covering many of the topics about the moon landings. However, we have found a few minor details here and there which need to be corrected. In American Moon, the theory is proposed that NASA figured out they needed to fake it in the year 1965 and that NASA made a deal with the Russians not to blow the whistle in the year 1967. We have found that information to not be correct. What actually happened was this. NASA figured out they needed to fake it in the year 1962 and NASA made a deal with the Russians not to blow the whistle in 1965. Let us examine the evidence. First of all, let us examine this NASA document. It says here that on July 11, 1962, James Webb made an announcement that the Lunar Orbit Rendezvous Program had been selected as the method for reaching the moon. This means that all their previous plans for creating a space station were cancelled. It also says here that there was much debate and infighting about this decision and that there was a strong opposition from within NASA towards this LOR or Lunar Orbit Rendezvous Program. So why was there so much debate and opposition to this program? Basically it was because of this. The Lunar Orbit Rendezvous Plan was not a practical plan. Werner von Braun had been talking about building a space station for nearly 10 years prior to this. The reason why he knew a space station was needed was because a ship which could protect the astronauts from the deadly radiation of space would need to be extremely heavy, and such a heavy type of ship would need to be refueled at the space station before heading to the moon. In this 1955 video, we can see Werner von Braun standing next to his space station. We can see him discussing his plan to use the space station as a refueling stop. This was a practical plan. The ship he was considering sending to the moon had not only a heavy amount of shielding, but it also had a nuclear powered generator on board which could create a shield around the craft. He knew that this was the only way to protect the astronauts from the radiation. But yet, here he is in 1962 promoting the Lunar Orbit Rendezvous Plan showing a couple of flimsy crafts with no protection from the deadly radiation of space. This was basically his way of telling the world that NASA was going to fake it. In order to fully understand why we know this, we are going to have to put this event into its historical context. What was the political and economic situation going on before and after this decision? On May 25 of 1961, JFK made an announcement to Congress about his intention to put a man on the moon. This took place just about one month after the whole Bay of Pigs affair. The Bay of Pigs was basically an attempted coup. The CIA and other powers that be wanted Kennedy out of office. And although the Bay of Pigs didn't really work, it did succeed in making Kennedy look really bad in the public eye. The mainstream media was criticizing him for not handling the affair properly. Kennedy's announcement to put a man on the moon was an attempt to save face. He wanted the public to see him in good light again after the Bay of Pigs affair. 
After this announcement, NASA knew the pressure was on. From May of 1961, three things started happening. First, NASA had to decide which plan they were going to use to get to the moon, and they also needed to start preparing a budget for this plan. The third thing was that Congress had to discuss among themselves and agree how much money to award NASA. To make matters worse, NASA knew absolutely nothing about the moon at the time. They hadn't even been able to send any craft to the moon, and had only barely succeeded in sending the first man into space just a few weeks before. Basically, all their plans for sending a man to the moon were based purely on science fiction. From 1961, the discussion going on was between which one of three options they had for reaching the moon. The first was to send one super big and super heavy rocket on a direct course to the moon without a need to refuel. This super big and heavy craft was known as the Nova, but this approach seemed highly unlikely. The rocket which had carried Alan Shepard up into space on May 5th of 1961 was already much bigger than anything they had ever built, and that one didn't even go into Earth orbit. Earth orbit was not achieved until February 20th of 1962, and since they were having so much trouble just reaching Earth orbit with one rocket, imagine how big one rocket would need to be in order to carry a man all the way to the moon. So then the choice came down between the other two options. One was to create Von Braun's space station and send up a heavy craft there to refuel, and the third was this so-called Lunar Orbit Rendezvous program. The Lunar Orbit Rendezvous plan had been proposed several years earlier by John Hobolt, but very few people believed in it. The size of the ship was just too small to offer any protection from the radiation. This was basically a let's fake it type of plan. Starting at the beginning of 1962, a huge series of debates and discussions began as to whether they were going to proceed with Von Braun's practical space station plan or to go ahead and fake it with the lunar orbit rendezvous plan. After six months of debate and infighting, Warner Von Braun finally caved in. On June 7, 1962, Von Braun stood up in a meeting and read from a prepared note announcing that he was officially accepting the Lunar Orbit Rendezvous plan. He was probably not very happy about this decision, but he felt that at least it might be possible to send unmanned crafts to the moon by using this approach, because trying to build a giant ship in a giant space station was certainly not going to happen by the end of the decade. After Von Braun signed over to the Lunar Orbit Rendezvous plan on June 7, 1962, it was only a matter of about a month before everyone else was in agreement that this was the approach they were going to take, and a final budget was submitted. On July 1, 1962, Congress met and started discussing the appropriations for NASA's budget on the fiscal year beginning in 1963. Congress finally reached a decision and awarded NASA with a $3.7 billion budget on September 25th. One of the first things NASA did was to start producing this animated video showing what the Lunar Orbit Rendezvous program would look like. Despite the fact that this fake Lunar Orbit Rendezvous program had already been set into motion, it was not entirely too late to stop it there was still one obstacle in the way, and that was Kennedy. Kennedy would never have allowed them to go on if he knew that they were going to fake it. Kennedy was putting huge pressure on them to make putting a man on the moon as the top priority. In this very interesting video, there is a heated debate between Kennedy and James Webb, where James Webb is trying to appeal to Kennedy about other space priorities, and how little they knew about the moon and Kennedy giving them sharp replies about fantastic expenditures which wreck the budget, so they had better make putting a man on the moon as the number one priority. Now we are not implying here that NASA's space program had anything to do with Kennedy's assassination. Kennedy's assassination had primarily to do with Executive Order 11110, which attempted to take power away from the Fed. However, Kennedy was putting a lot of pressure on NASA to make it to the moon, and faking it would certainly have not been an option under his watch. 
So even though plans were already in motion for faking it as early as 1962, NASA could have easily switched back to this more practical space station program at any time, that is, if they would have been given all the time and money they wanted to do it correctly. In order to really set the plans into stone for faking it, first they needed the president's approval. And as we know, Kennedy was assassinated on November 22, 1963, allowing Johnson to step in. Johnson was a publicly admitted Freemason. Here is a list of 14 other publicly admitted Freemasons who were working on the Apollo programs from the beginning, including James Webb. And these 14 were just the publicly admitted ones. At the time, there were many Freemasons who were not willing to admit their membership publicly, so the true number of Freemasons working at NASA might never really be known. And here is a photo of James Webb explaining the Lunar Orbit Rendezvous program to his Freemasonic buddy Lyndon Baines Johnson. It was probably a meeting just like this one where Webb explained to Johnson that the only way to make it by the end of the decade was to fake it. And Johnson certainly gave the go-ahead for this plan. Before we go on, we need to answer the important question of why did they decide to go ahead and fake it? Why didn't they just admit that it can't be done before the end of the decade? What would they gain from faking it? The answers to these questions need to be explained on three different levels. On the top level is the global banking elite. Below them is their Freemason puppets. And below them is the normal public. For the top banking elite, the ones who believe that war is good for business, they knew that America was going to be entering into the Vietnam War soon, and that a moon landing would be a perfect distraction while this war was going on. On the bottom level was the normal American public. For them, the reason why NASA had to go to the moon was very clear and simple. The scientific achievement of landing a man on the moon would bring humanity together. These were the words which came out of every one of the astronauts' mouth that humanity has finally become united. These were the words coming out of the mouth of every member of Mission Control, how humanity benefited by a greater understanding of Earth and our place in the universe. And these were even the words which came out of Nixon's mouth during his historic phone call, that Earth has become one in your achievement, certainly a cause worth lying for. However, what did the Freemasons believe? Did they feel it would help in bringing humanity closer to a new world order? Here in this detailed painting from the Masonic Temple in England, we can see Apollo, the sun god, riding in his four-horse chariot. The symbolism here represents that the philosophical beliefs of the Masons, that their scientific values and traditions, blending with the spiritual transcendence, would eventually lead to the unfolding of a divine and heavenly plan. Certainly for the Freemasons, the god of Apollo was not one to be messed with. But why name a mission to the moon after Apollo the sun god? Why not name it after Artemis the moon goddess? Perhaps these Masons knew that the first Apollo mission would be a fake, and that the Artemis missions which came later would be the ones which really reached the moon. Now, before they could go ahead and fake it, one important step needed to be taken. America had not even been able to send an unmanned craft to the moon. They couldn't even hit the moon or crash into it. In 1962, all three of the Ranger spacecrafts which they attempted to send to the moon all failed. So they began to do research into why they had failed. Eventually, they discovered that the problem was due to the flaking of the gold plating within the diodes due to the radiation of deep space. So they set out to create a new type of diode which could handle the radiation. This problem was eventually solved in 1964, with Ranger 6 making the proper prescribed impact with the moon and only a slight problem with the TV camera failure. And finally, by Ranger 7, they were able to keep the TV cameras rolling all the way down until the lunar impact. However, we still haven't addressed the question of why the Russians didn't blow the whistle on the Apollo hoax. In order to answer that question, 
we are going to need to take a closer look at what was going on in the Soviet Union at the time. In the same way that Kennedy was a wild card for the bankers in America, Nikita Khrushchev was a wild card for the bankers in the Soviet Union. He had been a lifelong friend of Stalin, but once he came to power in 1953, he turned against Stalin and started a process of de-Stalinization. What does this mean, really? Stalin was a cruel and ruthless dictator, but he was still a puppet of the bankers. He was an actor and he played his part well. At the end of World War II, Stalin was told that the Soviet Union needed to start pretending to be in a cold war with America, and Stalin played that role very well. Nikita Khrushchev didn't play along with that game. He wasn't interested in playing this fake game of artificial hostilities with America. He wanted a clear and open friendship with America. Kennedy and Khrushchev were both working towards peace, but peace was not something which the bankers wanted. In the same way that the bankers wanted to get rid of Kennedy, they also wanted to get rid of Khrushchev. And in both cases, the Bay of Pigs was used as the excuse. In the same way that the mainstream media in America attacked Kennedy for not handling the Bay of Pigs correctly, the mainstream media in the Soviet Union also attacked Khrushchev for not handling the Bay of Pigs properly. In 1964, Khrushchev was taken out of office, and a new puppet which the bankers could control was put into place. Indeed, had Kennedy and Khrushchev remained in power, there could have even been a joint U.S.-Soviet moon mission. Kennedy proposed the idea to the United Nations on September 20th, 1963, but the powers that be did not want that to happen. The Soviet media ignored the event and refused to even report on the fact that Kennedy had made this proposal, and Khrushchev was not even allowed to reply. The powers that be wanted the so-called Cold War to go on. The powers that be had bigger things in plan. Firstly, they wanted the Vietnam War to escalate, with the U.S. fighting on one side and the Soviet Union supplying weapons to the other side. Also, there was another wild card which they had to get rid of. The leader of Czechoslovakia had also started this process of de-Stalinization, or making friendship with the West, and he had to be removed. The invasion of Czechoslovakia began in 1968 in order to remove Alexander Dubček from power. In October of 1964, Khrushchev was removed from power and Alexei Kosygin replaced him. So who was this Kosygin and why was he the perfect man to carry on this great Cold War hoax? It would be impossible to find out if he was a member of any secret societies because supposedly secret societies had been banned during the time of the Soviet Union. But as we all know, the true story of what goes on behind the scenes always remains hidden from us. Kosygin had been a good friend of Trotsky, and in particular had supported a movement started in the Soviet Union known as the United Opposition. This was a group who had opposed Stalin and for which Trotsky was exiled in 1928 and eventually assassinated in 1940. The main cause of this disagreement, according to the mainstream media, is that it had to do with some kind of left-right differences of opinions. However, the truth is that there might be some darker issues at hand. In 1937, Stalin initiated what is known as the Great Purge, in which hundreds of thousands of people were murdered. The main reason for this was that Stalin, being the puppet he was, knew that World War II would be coming soon, and he had to make sure that all the people surrounding him would be willing to play their part in this great charade. But somehow, Kosygin survived this Great Purge. How did Kosygin survive even though he was a clear sympathizer with Trotsky? Even Khrushchev wrote in his memoirs, he can't explain how Kosygin survived this great purge. Was he just lucky, or was the reason he survived due to the fact that he was a member of the same secret society which Stalin was a part of? The world might never know. 
However, one thing can be said. Stalin was the perfect puppet for carrying out the role he was supposed to play during World War II, and Kosygin was the perfect puppet for carrying out the part he was supposed to play in the so-called Cold War, which the mainstream was feeding to the whole world. Coming back to the so-called space race, we are going to look at Anthony Sutton's opinion. In this 1964 experiment known as Echo 2, a giant reflective balloon was sent up into high altitude in order to bounce radar and communication signals off of it. Moscow was receiving the signals bounced off the satellite, but they declined to return any communication. The Soviets' own satellite technology was not providing them with complete meteorological data like the U.S. had. According to Anthony Sutton, the Soviet space program is far less technically advanced than has been generally believed, and fear of disclosing this backwardsness inhibits the Soviets from taking advantage of superior U.S. technology. We are going to be quoting a lot more from Anthony Sutton in part two of this presentation. So the Soviets may have been in the lead all the way up until 1964, but then they quickly fell far behind. If they had maintained a lead up until 1964, then why was it so? First, we need to understand the transfer of German intellect to the Soviet Union after World War II. Many people are familiar with Operation Paperclip, which transferred Nazi intelligence to the USA after the war. But not many people are familiar with Operation Osoaviakim, which transferred Nazi intelligence to the Soviet Union after the war. In fact, much more was transferred to the Soviet Union than it was to America. America even let the Soviets get the first pick. The Soviets had already gone through and gleamed off the cream of the crop. There was over 2,200 top German scientists transferred to the Soviet Union before the USA came in and took the remaining 1,600 German scientists. This could be the reason why the Soviet Union appeared to be ahead, at least up until 1964. Let us take a look at the actual accomplishments. In 1957, Russia launched the first satellite, Sputnik 1. America followed in 1958 with their first satellite, Explorer 1. In 1957, Russia put the first dog in space with Sputnik 2, not repeated by the Americans until 1961 with the first chimp in space on the Mercury Redstone 2. In 1959, Russia reached escape velocity and put a craft on the way to the moon with Luna 1 achieved by the Americans in 1960 with Pioneer 5, which put a craft on the path to the sun. In 1959, Russia was the first to crash into the moon with Luna 2, not repeated by the Americans until 1961 with Ranger 2. In 1959, Russia was the first to send back images of the lunar surface with Luna 3 not repeated by the Americans until 1964 with Ranger 7. In 1961, Russia put the first human into orbit with the Vostok 1. America only got Alan Shepard into a suborbital flight in 1961, and John Glenn finally reached Earth orbit in 1962. But that was it. By 1964, the Americans had not only caught up with the Russians, but had passed them. The remainder of the so-called space race was simply America sharing technology with Russia, allowing Russia to give the appearance of being ahead of them. We shall now attempt to prove this point. At the end of 1964, beginning of 1965, two of the perfect puppets were sitting in the seats of power, Kosygin and Johnson. In this presentation, we are proposing a theory that an agreement was made between the powers that be around this period of time, end of 64, beginning of 65. This proposal consisted of five points. First, America told Russia that they would be faking the moon landings, and Russia was not going to blow the whistle on it. Second. America would be supplying Russia with the technology they needed to keep ahead of the Americans in the so-called space race, 
and Russia would keep that lead all the way up until the end, when America pulls off a surprise win by putting a man on the moon. Third, Russia would be focusing their attention on creating the first space station, and America would eventually link ships with them and form the first international space station in 1975. Fourth, America would stop the production of nuclear weapons, and America would be supplying Russia with the technology and materials so that Russia would eventually surpass the Americans in the so-called nuclear arms race. Fifth, and finally, the worst point of all, America would be supplying the weapons to Russia, which Russia would then use to kill American soldiers in the Vietnam War. Now this agreement was not made in a face-to-face -face meeting between Kosygin and Johnson. In fact, the first face-to-face -face meeting between Kosygin and Johnson, such as you see in this picture, did not take place until 1967. However, face-to-face -face meetings had already become obsolete by 1964. One of the transatlantic cables included a direct phone line between Washington and the Kremlin. It was called the Moscow-Washington Hotline, and the agreement to install it had been signed on June 20th, 1963. So certainly by the time of Johnson and Kosygin, it would have been very simple for them to have made this agreement over the phone. Kosygin was an expert in English, since he had been an ambassador to many countries before in his previous government positions. Now, let us come back to our timeline of the events of the so-called space race. At the end of 64, beginning of 65, America had asked Russia to stay ahead of them in the space race. These are the events in the order of which they took place. Supposedly, the Russians made the first EVA with Vashkod II in March of 65, and America made their first EVA just two months later with Gemini 4. The Russians made the first soft landing on the moon with Luna 9 on January 31, 1966, and America made their first soft landing on the moon seven and a half months later with Surveyor 2. The Russians put a craft into a stable lunar orbit with Luna 10 on April 3, 1966, and America put their first craft into lunar orbit just two months later with Lunar Orbiter 1. And finally, the Russians sent animals to orbit the moon and come back to Earth on September 14, 1968, with Zond 5. And the Americans, of course, didn't need to send animals first. They supposedly just went ahead and sent humans to circle the moon just three months later with Apollo 8. However, there is a problem with this timeline. America had asked the Russians to stay ahead of them in the so-called space race, and that required them to do their first EVA on March of 1965. However, the Russians said that they would not be technically ready to make that deadline, so America told them, that's okay, you can just go ahead and fake it. When one watches the video of this supposed EVA of Alexei Lenovo on Vashkod 2, it is very apparent that it is just an actor floating around on wires in front of a projection screen with a video of Earth orbit being played behind him. And most importantly, when one looks at the sun's reflection in his visor, we can tell that these are just studio lights. Compare that to the real EVA of Ed White on Gemini 4. Look at how the sun appears in his visor. This is the way the real sun should look when it is reflected in an astronaut's visor. So coming back to the question of why didn't the Russians blow the whistle on the Apollo moon hoax? The Russians knew full well that America was going to be faking parts of their moon missions. Russia was faking parts of their space program as well, and America knew it. Neither side was going to blow the whistle on the other side. Now, let us come to the question of the so-called nuclear arms race. According to Wikipedia, America had supposedly been trying to keep their nuclear arms technology a secret from the Soviets, and that it was only thanks to the efforts of a few spies that this technology was leaked to the Soviet Union. According to Anthony Sutton, that narrative is complete nonsense. America had been supplying the Soviet Union directly with nuclear technology since long before the Cold War began. We will prove that claim later in Part 2 
when we show Anthony Sutton's documented evidence for that. But aside from where the Soviets got their technology from, the important thing is what happened after the agreement in 64-65. As we can see here clearly on this chart, America had stopped the stockpile of nuclear weapons in 1965 and then eventually started decreasing their stockpile while Russia was constantly increasing their stockpile. This allowed the Russians to eventually catch up with America in 1977, just two years after the joint U.S.-Soviet space station and eventually surpassed them. We can also see here in this chart how from 1964 on the U.S. was constantly decreasing both the number of launchers they had and the overall megatonnage of nuclear weapons they had while the Soviets were constantly increasing them. As we will see later in Anthony Sutton's work, this was purely due to a transfer of technology. So it becomes clear that this whole Cold War thing was a hoax. Both the so-called space race and the so-called nuclear arms race were pre-planned events with technology being leaked to the other side in order to create an artificial illusion of a Russian lead. Now we come to what must be the most scariest and most troubling event of this whole Cold War hoax. On July 2, 1964, Johnson passed the Civil Rights Act. He did this not because he was concerned about the actual civil rights of any of the American people. He mostly did it to ensure he would win the November elections which were coming up to the end of the year. The public would be very impressed by this as the battle for civil rights had been going on for a very long time. The public however had no idea of what was to come. They had no clue as to the plans being made in secret meetings and how Johnson would soon be leading them into a very long and bloody Vietnam War. So one month after Johnson passed the Civil Rights Act, he gave the green light for the false flag attack which would drag America into the war. Even Wikipedia is forced to admit that this was a false flag event, as no North Vietnamese boats were even present during the acclaimed August 4th attack. Regardless, the mainstream media jumped all over this Gulf of Tonkin incident, just like they did with the Pearl Harbor false flag attack which brought America into World War II, and the RMS Lusitania false flag attack which brought America into World War I. On August 4th was the Gulf of Tonkin false flag event. On October 14th, Kosygin was put into power in the Soviet Union and on November 2nd, Johnson won the American presidency. So it was just after these events that the secret phone call took place in which plans for the fake moon landing and the fake Vietnam War were put into motion. America started reducing their nuclear arms stockpile and America began helping the Soviet Union increase their nuclear arms stockpile. American bombers started their bombing runs in February of 1965 and American troops landed on the shores of Vietnam in March of 1965. However, America had given Soviets advanced radar tracking technologies so Soviet ships could spot the American bombers and plot their courses. The Soviets would warn the North Vietnamese headquarters to evacuate the areas to which these bombers were heading. Due to this advanced warning system, not one single North Vietnamese military leader was killed in any of these bombing runs. And soon enough, Russia began supplying North Vietnam with tanks, planes, helicopters, guns, and ammo, and most importantly was the surface-to-air missiles which could shoot down the US F-4 Phantom fighters out of the sky. The sad thing is that all the military equipment Russia had been giving to the North Vietnamese were being manufactured in Soviet plants which had U.S. funding. As we shall soon discover in Anthony Sutton's research, these Soviet weapons factories were not only founded by U.S. industrialists, but also the raw materials they were processing also came from U.S. sources. So basically, the U.S. was supplying the weapons to the Soviet troops, which would then be used to kill the U.S. soldiers. So what was going on with our so-called space race while this terrible and bloody Vietnam War was going on? America kept on developing the technology needed in order to be able to pull off the man on the moon hoax 
and in the meanwhile, they would be leaking the technology to the Russians so that they could appear to be in the lead. And so while America was developing the technology to send unmanned crafts to the moon, the Russians were developing the technology for the joint U.S.-Soviet space station, which was supposed to occur in 1975, just 10 years later. In 1967 was the Soviets' first attempt at docking two Soyuz crafts, but the astronaut died. In 1968 was their second attempt, and although they came close, they failed to make the docking. In 1969, Soyuz 4 and Soyuz 5 docked together, which was a big step towards making their first space station. Later on in 1969, Soyuz 6, 7, and 8 all failed to dock together. In 1971 was their first attempt at an actual space station, Salyut 1, and although their first attempt in April failed, their second attempt was successful with Soyuz 11. In 1973, the second attempt at a space station, Salyut 2. This failed, but the Soyuz 13 did succeed in acting as a temporary space station. In 1974, Salyut 3 was the third space station, and there was one successful docking with Soyuz 14, but an unsuccessful docking with Soyuz 15. In 1975, Salyut 4 was the fourth space station, and there were two successful dockings with Soyuz 17 and Soyuz 18. And finally, in July of 1975, was the Apollo-Soyuz joint mission, with a Soviet ship and an American ship docking together. The rest is history, leading up to the International Space Station which we have today. So while America was off faking their moon landings, the Russians were doing some practical work down in low Earth orbit preparing for the space station. <laughs>